Hello everyone and uh, welcome to the first latest Tech Trends webinar of uh, this year. This is the 8th edition of the latest Tech, uh, tech Trends webinar by Orada Tech Hub. And uh, we are happy to start uh, the year with an um, interesting subject. We're talking about immersive technology and uh, today I have with me Timmy Gurel. Uh, as we do every time, we have a first part uh, where we have an introduction into the subject and then we have the small break uh, where we will go to Slido. So um, please, to all of you who watch live this webinar, please go to oradatechhub.ro slash live. As you know, if you're not for the first time uh, watching our webinars, and uh, there you can watch uh, the webinar live and also have access to the sl Slido widget uh, where in the break, in the short break between the two parts, um, you, can, um, you can answer the questions that Timmy uh, prepared for us today. And also, if you have any questions during the presentation, please be free and I encourage you to go to Orate Hub that row slash live and in the same uh, Slido widget ask any question you have for Timmy or for us today. Okay, so uh, Timmy, let's get back to our subject. Uh, but first, please tell us a little bit about yourself. We know that you're from Oradia. How did you end up in Sweden at Volvo? So just in short, I am Timmy Guro and I am from Oradia. I am an innovation leader at Volvo Cars and um, I started, I studied at uh, Emmanuel High School in Oradia and uh, I did uh, math and programming and then I moved to Copenhagen. So I, I used the title Snapback to Reality, Here Comes Gravity and the reference to Eminem is there for a reason. I work with uh, immersive technologies, especially with uh, VR, AR. Uh, but then, we, 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 while developing these technologies and while we are starting to explore different scenarios, when you work in a big corporation, especially in automotive industry, which is super traditional, yeah. uh, that's when gravity hits you, <laughs> and that, right. that's when you face all the problems and you know hurdles that you need to overcome. Um, so as I said, like I, I work as an innovation leader and I have a background in music, fashion, working with uh, game engines, uh, investments. Um, and I will take you a bit through my story. Okay. Can you just, uh, yes, please uh, make, yeah, do it in the... Awesome. Example one. Yeah. Perfect. So I come from Romania. I use this picture because people know what it is <laughs> when I yeah. present in other forums uh, and <laughs> exactly and, and I moved to Copenhagen um, after I finished high school because I felt that uh, I didn't fit necessarily with the systems that we had back home uh, like I didn't find a university where I would uh, be able to develop the skills that I wanted to develop uh, it was a leap of faith. Uh, I, I moved there with a really good friend, uh, Paul Pantea. He, he used to be my desk mate in high school. So we moved together. Both of us, we were dreamers. We had no clue how Denmark works, where the, the rents were super expensive. And as I said, uh, my initial plan was to pursue an artist's life. But then again, gravity hit me and um, I was homeless for two months, sleeping in airports and um, different places. So I actually have that story, like if you saw the movie with Tom Hanks, The Terminal, that was my life where me and Paul, we were waking up in the morning, brushing our teeth in, in, in the airport uh, bathroom while uh, some businessman, you know, he was preparing for <laughs> his life. <laughs> yeah. And we were going to school and after school we were looking for rent and places to live and it, it was quite a tough period and uh, I was playing uh, music uh, in different places to earn money to be able to go to school. That was my initial job. 
uh, because I still didn't want to quit this creative dream, right? And um, after that, uh, in my school, um, one of our teachers, uh, he saw me and Paul, and uh, he saw that we were a bit different. We had a bit of different skill set. We were strong and articulate in mathematics and physics. Um, but he tried to open some doors for us. And my university, Alborg University, uh, moved in what it used to be the Nokia main tech hub in, in oh. Copenhagen. And when Nokia fired people, uh, that was like 10 years ago, um, they gave them compensation, like a year worth of salary. And engineers and developers were smart enough to, you know, not spend it on their own, but they said, hey, let's cluster our money together. I mean, at the end of the day, we are world experts in telecommunication technologies and so on. And in the same time, Volvo bought the previous uh, user experience center from Nokia, which was in the same building. So my university moved in and created an incubator, like a startup bootcamp and um, venture cup, where they were mixing students with fresh ideas with experienced people from Nokia, and they formed a lot of startups. Uh, some of the startups that I met there, and my teacher introduced me to these guys, were um, David Helgeson and Joachim Ante. They were a uh, Unity 3D founder uh, back then there were like just a few people working in a basement in Copenhagen, and now it's a forty billion dollar company. Uh, they filed for an IPO this summer, and um, they are still my mentors, and uh, they they open a lot of doors for me. So at that time, I worked with them a bit. Uh, I still felt sorry that I quit my creative dream, but I understood that using that tool, I can actually. Uh, choose who I want to be. I can be both the creative, focusing on design and building worlds and so on, both as being geeky and work with AI and programming. So I engaged with a few companies uh, where uh, there is a company that was doing eye tracking for disabled people and for research and so on. But then we went to CES. Um, we were putting eye tracking in everything, in watches, in um, tablets, and so on. And we managed to make it really, really cheap. There were three founders, and I was their first employee. And I said, well, this sounds nice, but I think the money, really, and the f full potential is in uh, gaming. So I hacked Fruit Ninja, and you were able to play with your eyes. and the eyes are the fastest organ in the body, which meant the first time we tried it, we broke the world record. And um, we took this to CS uh, some years ago, and Richard Branson saw it. He actually played Fruit Ninja, and wow. we got a big investment. Then uh, we got a lot of attention at the, that time. And I also met uh, Palmer Lucky. He was the founder of Oculus. and. He was just a kid showing his prototype. I mean, I'm well, well way younger than him. Uh, but he gave us a prototype uh, of the first Oculus um, uh, back then. And I took it home, and I immediately put an eye tracking sensor in it. And I filed a lot of patents uh, when it came to foveated rendering, which means that you're only rendering at full quality the things that you're looking at, which managed to compress the quality and save resources so you didn't need the monster computer anymore you can do it with cheaper hardware which revolutionized um not only the vr industry but the gaming industry as well uh so that led us to collaborate with a few companies so in collaboration with unity and the i tribe uh, we made a game for lego lego star wars which was actually my bachelor thesis, where you were, you were able to be like a Jedi. You could aim with your eyes and think when to shoot. So I used EEG technology, brainwaves, where we could measure, um, you know, where, like different thoughts and actions and so on. The only problem was that we had to showcase this game to a Lego world where there were like 2,000 kids. Uh, and you can't make kids stay still. 
uh, and you know go through the calibration process for eye tracking for brain waves and so on. So we had to do a bit of gamification for that part, which which worked really well, and it led this guy that is uh, <laughs> quite quite a legend now. Uh, it led this guy to acquire the company I was part of. Wow. Uh, I had a lawsuit with Facebook for <laughs> three years. I didn't tell a lot of people, but I went back to my mentors and teacher, um, uh, and the guys from Unity helped me with some good lawyers in US. I was still really young, around 24. Um, when this happened, I was still doing my master's, so I had no clue what a contract is, what copyright means, what patents, and you know all those things. Yeah. And um, American lawyers are not the friendliest people on earth. I mean, they, they have the smile like Mark here, but uh, they charge you a lot. And again, <laughs> I was still a student back then. Um, so I needed a corporate job. I needed to pay bills, right? Um, but as a transition, before going to Silicon Valley, where I, where I went for a while uh, with Volvo, I tried to work a bit with fashion because I, I miss doing creative work. So I work with some Danish designers where I did a bit of creative directing, uh, arrang arranging photo shoots, coming with concepts. Um, and it was just because I was so sick of the tech world after what happened. It was the classic story when a big giant buys you and you know they try to kill you and so on. Um, so what, what I did was, was trying to distance myself from tech, but then I remembered that while I was working with game development in Unity, again, this creative directing and building concepts and so on was really similar to, to the workflow I had as a developer in Unity. So um, Volvo approached me and they asked me if I want to join them to work uh, as a developer first uh, and as an eye tracking expert. The only problem was since I had a loss, I was not a lo allowed to work with eye tracking for many years. So I had to invent my job at Volvo. Um, that's a bit of my story. Uh, the reason I tell this story, it's to show, um, like I had an internal conflict this uh, or over the past 10 years uh, where I, I didn't know if I'm a creative or a nerd. And then I found mm -hmm. how to intersect those. And I think that intersection is what sparks innovation. Um, and you had to learn a lot of strategy and tactics, how to navigate through corporate uh, politics and so on. As I said, I come from startup um, background where I was really afraid of corporations, especially about automotive corporations. And I was never a car person. I remember my father always wanted to have that father and son uh, discussion. Like, hey, okay. Yeah, let's open the hood. Let's look at the engine. Let's kick some tires. I was never interested. I was more into guitars and music and guitar pedals and, you know, dreaming about being a rock star or whatever. <laughs> so, at least, did you get a license, a driving license? Oh, yeah. Do you have yeah, yeah I, I, I had it. <laughs> yeah, when okay. I was in so what I learned was that I had to align with the view. I had to understand the industry I'm working with, understand their vision and mission. And I really liked Volvo's vision, like freedom to move in a personal, sustainable, and safe way. And there's no secret that automotive industry is transforming into being software companies instead. You see that with, with Tesla. With with Volvo. Yeah, exactly. I had to learn the way of working and how to find uh, believers or champions or sponsors in the company, like uh, high management that understand the work that I'm doing. So for a year or two, I, as I said, I had to reinvent my job and I took this space. It was empty before. Um, and I, I started to do a bit of skunk work, you know, going and asking people what they work on. And I realized that there were like five simulators at Volvo doing almost the same things and spending millions and millions of dollars. And people didn't talk to each other. So oh. I gathered everyone in the room and I started to focus on democratization.
monetization of simulators and assets. Like everyone needs a 3D model to make a simulator. Everyone needs an environment, a moose to cross the road. So we yeah. worked on a common simulator architecture and um, <clears throat> a lot of co focus on AR, VR. But before yeah. jumping in what is actually <laughs> VR, AR, um, I was thinking that I kind of saw it coming uh, since I was in, uh, in, in university. I, I saw a lot of movies like Matrix, Minority Report, and I knew that we, we will live in a metaverse. And uh, I knew that I have to take the, you know, one chunk of it and try to, to define what VR will be for me and for others. Instead of being a follower, I wanted to be a trendsetter and a pioneer of the area. And if you push it so hard, uh, it's lonely out there because no, no, you don't find people that resonate with your ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. a saying, uh, if uh, if you're two steps ahead, then you're perceived as a leader. If you're 10 steps ahead, you might be perceived as a threat. So exactly, exactly. That's a problem with innovators. Yeah. So one thing here is like uh, the difference between VR, AR, MR, XR is that virtual reality is like when, when you wear typically a headset, an Oculus, a Vive, a Vario, and everything around you is 3D, so everything is virtual. Then yeah. augmented reality is where you still see the reality, but you overlay content on it. And that typically was what we saw with Google Glass and what we see now with Snapchat and Instagram filters. Yeah. Um, that is AR, for instance. Uh, yes. Pokemon Go as well. Mixed yeah. reality is where you combine both VR and AR and you manage to have a perfect occlusion. So you can uh, have um, virtual content blending in really good with uh, real content. Okay. And here you require really good uh, slam technique, which is like a simultaneous localization and mapping where you need to be aware of the objects around you and then overlay virtual content. Yeah, like Jarvis in the Iron Man movie. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, what we saw in 2019 is that AR and VR engineers that grew up with 1,400%. And wow. 2020, because of Corona, that was that reached 2,000%, 2, 2, which is more than all the other back-end, full-stack, uh, cybersecurity and... Uh, blockchain engineers combined, uh, which actually yeah. shows that it's high demand for this um, for this uh, technologies. And if you think, uh, Unity is like I think eighty percent of all the uh, games that you play on your mobile phone are made in Unity. It's like, and now they expand to automotive, to architecture, uh, doing uh, car infotainment, and so on. But at the end of the day, is the same technique that you're using to develop games. And and this is just crazy. And I said Corona accelerated this even more. Uh, a bit of the history of XR. I found this weird graphic, but it kind of makes sense. Uh, the first VR headsets were made in uh, the 60s. And then it was just an experiment, some cameras that you look through and kind of almost like a TV screen uh, attached to your face. It was developed at uh, MIT uh, Media Head uh, okay. and uh, Media Lab, sorry, MIT Media Lab. And um, then it was heavily used by military, like flight simulators and so on. And of course, automotive started to use it in the 80s while well, was doing VR in the 80s, like cave systems where you have like this 360 globe projector. So you have these walls and you project content in and okay. you have a tracking camera so it, it can track your point of view. Uh, and then the gloves and so on with, uh, you know, the Nintendo era. And the term was kind of introduced in 1987. There are rumors that it was like, uh, Jared, if you guys saw Social Dilemma, Yes. The, weird guys, the weird guy with dreads, I met him in San Diego once. 
okay. he is kind of regarded as the parent of, of VR, but the VR term, not necessarily that invented virtual reality. Um, then it started to move more to towards consumers. It started to be more accessible. But Oculus Rift in 2010 was the first consumer ready, not ready <laughs> per se, it's well, still a long, long road to achieve that. But like it was the first one to hit the market. And now with Oculus mm -hmm. Quest, you see that uh, I think it more than 10 million people have access to it. So it, it's more, mm -hmm. it becomes like the consoles in the 90. You knew somebody that had a PlayStation 1 at home, right? Yeah, right. So, so now it starts to develop more and more. Um, what is really important in, uh, uh, in virtual reality that a lot of people uh, kind of skips is the user experience. And I work a lot with design. And in order to create a truly immersive experience, you really need to work with uh, psychology and uh, cognitive research and understanding how human beings perceive like objects and uh, information. Um, and I'm a big adept of uh, low cognitive load. So not to overload people with ex a lot of unnecessary information in their face, but also where do you place the information. Uh, the big mistake is that a lot of people transition directly from game development to VR. And what they do typically is they port a known game, like a shooter, to VR, yeah. okay. just re replacing mouse movement of keyboards with VR. Yeah. Uh, but then you're missing the point. <laughs> uh, you should develop it for VR directly. and make use of sound. Sound is the most underrated immersive technology. For me, my headphones, that's the, the most powerful immersive technology. And now with the Apple headphones, I can be in New York and put them on and I can feel like Maramuresh, right? <laughs> or I, <laughs> right? The whole world goes silent. Or if you have really powerful spatial computing platform where you can place a sound source almost like with pixel precision in the air. And I was playing Half-Life during pandemic in VR a lot, like for 70 hours. And imagine that you hear the zombie being behind you. And when, you know, <laughs> when it matches with your visual cue, then, then it's really powerful where both your movement, visual uh, haptics and sound uh, stimulus is satisfied. Uh, for that, we use a lot of technologies like hand tracking, um, eye tracking. We need to invent a new interaction system that makes sense to use in VR, like a, maybe a um, slider or a touch screen. Maybe it's not that effective in virtual reality. So you need to, to make use of contextual design, like applying graphics uh, on the 3D object so it makes sense. Uh, when I was at MIT exactly a year ago, in uh, end of January, uh, I was uh, teaching a course, almost <laughs> what I'm doing here, like this content. And then we had the hackathon where I was a judge, and it was about VR. And there was a team there, <laughs> some Russians, that brought this glove and a suit. And if you saw Ready Player One, it's exactly that suit. Like yeah. you can feel everything. And yeah. not only that, I can control your movement. So I can program the way you walk and move your hand, even if you want it or not. Uh, yeah. they, they stroke a really great deal with the military where and NASA. And they use this, uh, the astronauts use this on ISS under their clothes. So it stimulates their muscles while they are in uh, zero gravity. Oh, right. Uh, but for us, it means that we can have more immersive uh, experiences and we can use it for doing design review, ergonomic study, safety si uh, simulation, like how would how would the deployment of the airbag feel on your chest or your you know different uh, parts of your body so we can get more precision and immersion. And imagine that you have a, a virtual wall in front of you and w when you wear the, the suit and the glove, it actually stops your hand exactly where the virtual wall is and you feel that sense of touch, wow. which again really adds to, to the immersion.
That's powerful. Yes. And then eye tracking, as I said, you could use it in many ways, either for uh, optimization, the Fovity rendering technique that I mentioned, but also for uh, tracking emotions and expressions. You can understand so many things from the human eye. And I remember my grandma telling me that every time, like uh, how you can read people through their eyes and always look into people's eyes when they talk. And through pupillometry and the way people move their eye, you can track, as I said, if they're bored, if they're afraid. if And in an experience, you can trigger different uh, events based on that. If you saw Black Mirror Bandersnatch episode, where you can choose the next scene, right? Right. Imagine in VR that if you wear uh, EEG, like brainwave detection and eye tracking, you could actually track if and generate the scene, the next scene based on human emotion. Wow. Uh, for marketing and research, uh, we're using to see what if we move the central screen of the car uh, five centimeters higher, or what if we remove it and have a head up display instead? And we can check the human attention and stress level uh, if we put navigation on one screen or the other. So it's really powerful for data collection. Um, of course, as I said, prototyping is key here. Uh, so before you actually build it for VR, now you need to offer a lot of tools where you can actually focus on user experience and interaction. So you're more in control of how your AR experience will be. Um, now at Volvo, we are building a new museum that will be launched 2023. And before we have the building, we can actually prototype how the AR experiences will be there, uh, which again, can save us so much money and uh, time and resources. Um, this is another way of prototyping, right? Like how, how do you interact in VR? Like if you played games, you saw that, you know, you can just have a, an item just popping in your face or in your hand directly. So we were prototyping a lot uh, like this before creating the experiences to make it as natural as possible. So you simulated it in the real world and then... Uh, in, and then in, in VR, the code. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, then moving back to, to automotive, to Volvo, there is a big transition now moving from traditional uh, car makers to, to become like software oriented. Self-driving cars been a big topic for the past year, of uh, past 10 years and electrification, electric cars, sustainability, yeah. uh, sharing cars instead of owning them. And I think that is the future. Uh, and we see that more and more automakers are following, but it is a hard decision to, to make. And you can't take those decisions if you can't imagine the future. So one of our goals was how do we use <clears throat> VR AR to not only for marketing, but following the whole cycle in automotive from early design concepts to marketing, to service and training. So people get trained on how to build a car in factory, which again, saves a lot of money, simulation and, um, uh, simulating self-driving cars in different scenarios that are either too dangerous or too rare to test in real life. Like we would never gamble with people's lives in like, uh, you know, crash simulation, yeah. right? So we, right. We, we do simulate a lot. And then a human machine interface, like the screens you have in the car, they become bigger and bigger. You can have yeah. apps there, um, yeah. different services. And we are trying to build a data pipeline where we cover all these things by using the same architecture. And that's why we can save a lot of money in that sense. Um, I think I want to show you a video before we move forward. Uh, you just yeah. give me feedback if that works or how it works. <laughs> okay, sure. Right. Let's see. Origin to destination, A to B. The triumph of human civilization, 
relies on our ability to cover ever larger distances. Travel is as essential to life as the blood in your veins. From the turn of the 20th century, the automobile has shaped the man-made world and profoundly enriched the way we live. It shifted our perception of time and space. Days and weeks on foot or horseback became hours on the road. The miracle of flight further amplified our ability to reach further and faster than ever before. But to fit in an increasingly systematic and mechanized world, we find ourselves having to behave more like machines. In our striving for efficiency, have we lost empathy for the traveler? Efficiency shouldn't be about how much more work you can squeeze into your day. It shouldn't be how quickly you can get to where you're going, but how you get there. What if autonomous travel can eliminate the stress that lurks between A and B? Could autonomous technology be used to provide a space for you to live your life on the move, whichever way you choose? The 360C is a link that provides seamlessness between origin and destination, so your life, work, relationships and well-being don't have to be put on pause just because you're on the move. Nice. That was a great video. All right, thank you. Let me see how to share the presentation back. Yeah, it shows us uh, how, where, where, where are we going, and uh, how the future would look would look like, right? Yeah, ex exactly. And and you can't do that without testing and prototyping a lot. We we don't know the future. The moment we step into the future, I have like thousands of possibilities. And yep. storytelling is really powerful here. And I, I will go a bit more into depth there. So here are the examples that I mentioned, like starting from early design, we take a 3D model and we put it in context. So we see how a car will look in different settings. Then we can do a lot of user experience research. And we developed an internal tool where um, you can actually expose all the functions of the car from blinkers to uh, opening doors, key lock, uh, climate, and so on. And actually uh, having our management understand what's the status of the current you know, cars, uh, how, how far are we in the development, which is the first time we can actually connect designers and engineers as early as possible. Because car, car development usually takes about seven years, like every cycle is about seven years. So uh, it's really slow. But this wow. method allows us to make more iterations and uh, accelerate that we even cut it in half um, so we can do the testing as early as possible and simulate some things and of course you can simulate everything in a simulator uh, you still need test cars but maybe wow. not as many and just last year with this project that I initiated we managed to save over 150 million dollars in and wow. that's that's a lot <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. a big number, even yeah. for a big corporation like Volvo. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and again, like simulating scenarios as, as uh, you've seen before, trying to imagine the future. How do we make new interaction systems? Uh, we will, are we still having mobile phones in the future? You know, So we can yeah. prototype a lot and collaborate with partners like Google, Apple, and other big players and in integrating with different ecosystems. Uh, just today, we launched a developer portal. I had a press release in the morning where we were thinking 
what if we share with the world the things that we are using, like the tools, the APIs? So together with Unity, we released today this um, auto showroom template where you can learn how to uh, develop and design cars and integrate it with functions or make your own VR simulator and Anyone that downloads Unity, 7 million people will have access to this, which is huge brand exposure for us. Wow. But also in terms of innovation, we are uh, working towards open innovation where we can collaborate with developers like you, with uh, people that work in different uh, industries or services. Like uh, we had a case here where Amazon asked us if they can access the API to create an in-car delivery app where while you are at work, you can get your packages delivered in your trunk. And uh, so they made the app based on the API. So that's why we decided to open it up. So we made the developer.volvocars.com where you can create your own Android automotive app. You can use Unity to make you know different scenarios or movies or use it for simulator, for research. We have MIT and Stanford using our data sets for self-driving cars, like uh, training sensors and cameras. Um, and soon we are launching a design um, a design portal with, where uh, UI uh, designers, they can make their own app, but with our design system and uh, layout. That's interesting. So you're, uh, you're moving from a, a hardware product to a hard hardware product with the software platform yeah exactly and You're building yeah. a software layer on top of hardware yeah so we are, we're starting as a um, mobility ecosystem and becoming a software company and about a year ago i got a question from the ceo like how how should we move forward in the future what if we don't make cars anymore wow and i started this department the uh, open innovation arena where we focus on collaboration research but we look beyond the car we look on what if we do houses instead what if safety is not only about the car but safety as a service so you have a ios app that connects to your Apple headphones, that tracks your head and knows if a bike would hit you or not, right? So we're yeah. looking, we're looking at scenarios like that. And yeah, uh, but in, I, the same, in the same time, respecting the people that are building the car, because at the end of the day, they pay for our salaries and experiments. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was thinking uh, that Volvo has this core uh, value. Uh, safety. Mm. I know that you have uh, some kind of goal, or you reach the goal. No person killed or injured during a traffic accident or something like that. Yeah. So by 2020, we had a vision zero that we will have zero accidents um, involved in the new Volvos, right? And we were about safety since the beginning, since 1927. Yeah. But we, when we invented the seat belt, uh, we had this open approach that we had now with the APIs. We wanted to give it for free and a way for, for everyone to use, every car maker, because safety should be available for everyone. Yeah. Um, so and, and something and, common, every car has it now. Exactly, yeah. And in the beginning, if, if you would see the reactions, how people reacted, that this is absurd, it's more dangerous and whatever, and but then it saved, we managed to save like so many lives, like 1 million lives were saved in a crash. Um, and people have testimonies about that. And that's the, the reason why I choose to stay and work with the company like this, because I, I, my values are, are aligning with the company values. And now I'm put in a position even to write a new vision for the company, which is a difficult, place because it can uh, cause yeah. a lot of friction there is a lot of voices there that are anti-cars now like right they want to cancel all the diesel cars they want to take the cars outside cities yeah. and and in some countries it works <laughs> but i'm always giving romania an example when i'm in this conversation it's like 
hey, uh, well, while we talk about this, I've just been to visit my grandma in Maramuresh and there were horses and carriages there still, so I don't know. On the road, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But then again, that's the best example. Like my, my grandma doesn't speak Romanian and uh, I had to explain to her in a dialect where I, like Ukrainian dialect, I don't speak really well. I had to tell her, what am I doing at work? And that's an interesting challenge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and what I said was like, hey, do you know our neighbor Vasile is like the drunk of the village? <laughs> and you know, he gets drunk and then he crawls in his carriage and the horse takes him home. He knows where to go. And that was a bit of like a parallel with self-driving cars, except we won't carry drunk people around. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, very, a very good uh, image. Yeah. Um, as I said, we do a lot of research for safety. Like uh, <laughs> in comparison with Tesla, we, we don't want to test our technology on people, right? For us, mm -hmm. safety is the primary thing. So we need to do lots of simulations and tests before we release any software or everything. We don't do beta testing with our drivers, um, especially when it comes to self-driving and sensors. Um, we, we do a lot, we have a lot of psychologists and people working with cognitive behavior on how do they perceive uh, warnings, sounds. And if you drew the, the latest Volvo, the sound coming from the blinker is actually somebody cracking wood in a Swedish forest and we sampled that sound. And wow. <laughs> there is cognitive research we did with Stanford where it's actually proven that it makes you calmer in a stressful situation. Like when you're in traffic, you don't want to hear all the beep, beeping noises that to, to make you even more stressed than you are. Uh, even absence of sound, since we have such good sound systems and noise cancelling in the car, when it's suddenly quiet, you know that something's wrong, right? Right. Yeah. So no. UX, it's like really important for us. Um, here's a test how we used uh, AR into testing a new safety concept where we had a virtual um, head-up display that doesn't exist yet. And we were thinking, what would happen if a uh, moose crosses the road? How should we show that to the user? How do we make sure that the user saw the moves, like based on eye tracking cameras? And everything is real here except the moves crossing the road, that it's made in Unity. <laughs> and, and just being able to test that instead of only using computer simulation, but combine it with the real car, it's really, really powerful. Yeah. Um, so we use a lot of design thinking where we try to understand and uh, ideate and prototype test a lot with users. So we do clinics uh, where I'm sitting now, actually, it's a living lab. So it's set up as a house where we invite guest, guests and we do research with them. We see how they interact with their smart assistants, with their cars, how's their lifestyle. And that's because we are human centric at heart. Like everything we do, we're trying to understand how to get back to the roots. So uh, we start from prototypes like this, uh, where we try out, you know, we, we make it low fidelity so the people won't focus on the wrong things. Like, oh, but the design is not really like that, yeah. right? Uh, but, but we change their focus to different services and, um, different experiences so we can actually test that. Um, here we are testing like a self-driving cars where uh, this user never tried self-driving cars before and only after 10 minutes he forgot about driving and he was super confident even showing us picture with his daughter or whatever. And that makes you think, are we really investing billions in making self-driving cars just for people to be able to scroll on Instagram. Is that really meaningful for the humanity? Uh, mm -hmm. What type of experiences and um, things we should offer to have like a really good and meaningful uh, experience in the car? Mm -hmm. And to get to this future that I showed in the video, we actually deployed a couple of uh, hundreds of these cars in Pittsburgh in US and uh, 
also in China. And where, where we try to see, like, you know, it's really controlled environment. Like we have a few moving uh, between universities, like uh, carrying students. So it's really safe environments. Okay. So we try to see how the adoption would be for this uh, vehicles mm -hmm. in the future. Uh, and I got a question some time ago, like what, what did I see clearly today that I don't see maybe not three months ago, but let's say nine months ago, you know, when pandemic started. Because I, I mean, I put three months ago because that's when actually more restrictions came to Sweden. As you know, Sweden was pretty chill with Corona. Yeah. Um, and we see that there is a trend of deurbanization. People moving away from uh, cities and uh, they look for, you know, places where they can travel from two hours to five hours and they will live there from <clears throat> two days to 60 days. So temporary remote, uh, remote living, <clears throat> more like having a nomad style. Um, there's also this sustainable lifestyle where people are more conscious about the materials and what they're using and, you know, the whole Greta Thunberg uh, uh, oh. discussion there and fostering communities and how will that impact the uh, future of work? A lot of us, especially developers and tech people, we were able to work from home, right? Right. But if you look at Germany, which is heavily industrialized uh, country, uh, in 2020, only 17% of people were able to work from home. Hmm. That's because they need to be, you know, in, in a space. A where, yeah. yeah, exactly. And that that's another aspect where we try to use VR and AR for remote collaboration, uh, where you, you can actually have access to your products like a car. I mean, you can work from home and develop and launch a car, right? And it's a complex right. product. It's more complex than airplanes. It's like, you know, there's so many traffic regulations and governmental policies. So it's quite hard to to work on it. I mean, we are 40,000 people here. So imagine how we would need to coordinate everything to be able to work from home. So how do we make it in a really immersive and productive way? Um, and there's a big shift from mini computers, you know, mobile phones to the smartphones. And now we're moving into wearables. And I think in the next three years, we won't have mobile phones anymore. I don't think the phones are getting any bigger or thinner than they are. And the reason they add more cameras and sensors to it is not to take better pictures. It is for AR and capturing 3D. The next 36 months will be a huge uh, competition between Google, Facebook, Apple, and Tesla, and other people on who's capturing and creating a digital virtual twin of the world. 3D mapping, so you can have services on top of uh, of of the real world, right? To be more contextual. Um, mm -hmm. So I I spotted that trend because I, I I learned that in in university, and I always thought that uh, that's how it will work, and that's why I knew that sensors like eye tracking and BCI will be like crucial uh, to achieve that and uh, things like uh, hand tracking and touch. There are companies that are developing uh, contact lenses with AR. And I tried one uh, at MIT and it's like, you know, you can have your calendar in front of your eye and mm -hmm. notifications. Um, so we are moving from the unknown to something more defined. This area of VR, it's not, uh, you know, a fuzzy buzzword anymore, but it's becoming something more tangible. and. The reason I moved to automotive, I knew that in the future we'll have wearables, we will have sensors. Uh, we already have smartwatches that track our workout and so on. Uh, by wearing glasses and sensors, we will be like self-driving cars. And what better industry to learn that from to be able to pay in the future than automotive where they've been using all these sensors to actually be aware of the environment and what's around. Right. Uh, so here's a, here's a parallel where on the left, we have um, a simulation where we, we try uh, 
pedestrian detection in uh, parking lots and on the street. And on the right is the new iPhone 12 that has exactly the same sensor that we use for self-driving cars. And wow. it is, the iPhone doesn't have that sensor to take better picture. It is to track and uh, record objects. So there is a transition. And if you look at uh, Apple patents and what's happening, we see that this is the future where your desk will look like this. Yeah. Where well, everything, every, yeah, where everything is contextual. Like you can have information available at the right place at the right time. Okay. And you can, kind of yeah, you can configure your desk and screens and, uh, you know, information. Yeah. So uh, what you say is that we're entering a new era of mixed reality? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So there are a lot of rumors about Apple Glass now, the news. And we knew the problems that were with uh, Google Glass Google. in the beginning. And that those problems were mainly due to, I mean, it was not there yet. Like the computing yeah. power, the sensors, but the main problem was privacy with cameras. You don't want people to film me all the time, right? Right. And now we're even more aware of privacy after Cambridge Analytica and all those problems. Um, but that's why Apple is using radar technology where it can scan point cloud, but you can say that that's exactly that person, right? So you would be GPDR compliant in that sense. Um, here's another, Hi. wait, I need to mute it. Yeah, here's another concept of how the world could look like in a few years where you have information, uh, you know, notification, calendars, music available in front of your eyes. And the key here is like not to overpopulate with information, but make it really contextual and that it makes sense. So based on your activity or location, uh, the layout will change. So see here, for instance, you could be have safety on your bike as well, not only in cars. You can experience art in a different way. And now after the pandemics, uh, there's for sure that we won't travel for business and pleasure as we did. We won't go to concerts and uh, museums as we did. So things will change. Like imagine that you can go to Louvre in Oradia and see, you know, all, all the sculptures and paintings uh, while you stroll around Krishu. Um, also in architecture and construction where you have more contextuality. So you're able to see a bit more in the future. Sports and entertainment will be redefined, right? So it can become more immersive and less boring. So people will compete as what they would do with games. <clears throat> and there is a part here that I'm afraid of. Like I'm afraid that if we have this and I will talk to you, an ad will appear in your face like here. But the key yeah. is to, to do it the Scandinavian way, the Volvo way would be to be able to minimize everything and only have the things that matter in front of your eyes. So how do we achieve that collaborative action, rather empty narratives and buzzwords, right, about sustainability, right. about where AR will be and so on? And I think here I can show you our latest development. We launched this product two years ago. So at Volvo, we have an investment fund as well that is connected to my innovation org where we invest in startups and companies where we believe that they will fit with what we do. And we invested in this VR company where you can, this is AR. So you see the virtual car and you could see the reflection matches the reality. So you can see yourself in the virtual car. The resolution, if you tried VR before, this is 60 times better than anything you tried. And it costs 60 times more. Um, but for us, in as I said, in, um, in the industry, it doesn't matter because we save so much money wow. compared to traditional simulators, right? So imagine that you can try the latest concept before it's built, like as a designer of engineer, being able to experience okay. the car you're building before it hits the road. It's like super big. Uh, being able to see your hands, which was impossible before. 
so it blends pretty well still some glitches here and there but then being able to jump between realities so from the office suddenly you can be in venice and see how the car will look like um so it, it grows quite a lot then again uh, how will the future workspace look like since i started with this project, I was thinking many years ago, what if instead of having to take the headset off and then using the computer and then go back to VR to test it, you're uh, in VR all the time and you can bring your favorite tools, for instance, Unity, in VR so you, you have more contextuality. So it would be basically as jumping in the virtual matrix <laughs> and working there. Um, we collaborated with Meeting VR, who the founder is Romanian from Cluj. Um, I used to be his tutor in university when he moved to Copenhagen. And actually exactly maybe eight years ago, we were sitting in a cafe and he was telling me about his dream of building the metaverse. The, he called it Dreamscape at that time. And we were joking about different concepts and trends that will happen. And now it's so interesting to hang out, drink coffee and say, oh, look at where we are now. And we were so naive because the future accelerated even more. We were too shy in our predictions back then. So here, this is like a key thing in, during Corona. Like that handshake that I had was the first handshake in Corona times with my uh, you know, colleagues and so on. And it's weird how fast your brain adapts. Like if you see an avatar, even cartoonish avatar, that looks a bit the same or resembles a few features of a person you know, your brain adapts. It forgets that it, it is in VR. And you can start collaborating, bringing your Miro boards, your whatever agile tools you're using, videos, materials. So you can actually <clears throat> have that and work um, work remotely like this um, me and my team we started to have meetings like this working from home um, and it works pretty well we we're able to brainstorm we did a bit of research with uh, MIT and, un and the University in Berlin where we figure out that introverts tend to be more expressive and creative in, in VR and mm -hmm. the, the aspect of you know tribal competition like engineering versus design or the front end versus back end kind those boundaries kind of disappear in when you're in virtual reality this is a bit of behind the scenes how we made this happen in the beginning was lots of duct tape and stuff <laughs> but i never dreamed that we will get to do this where you can have virtual avatar sitting next to you while you drive a real car test safety scenarios. Um, and I was in San Francisco, uh, actually in Silicon Valley about what, two years and a half ago when we launched this. And when we launched it, I woke up to this in my hotel room and it was all over the news, like uh, Forbes. Uh, we even had uh, Mythbusters, Adam Savage test it. And I was wow. petrified. I was his biggest fan as a kid and just having him uh you know just validating my myth not busting it was like such i don't know it gave me so much energy and uh, confidence boost that I, I knew that we are on the right track and after this we, we we were approached by game studios by universal netflix and other you know um companies companies that are not traditionally collaborating with automotive as i said everyone is afraid of automotive because it's like traditional <laughs> safe slow uh but now we enabled so many collaborations and actually i think around spring there'll be an episode on netflix in the series abstract season three uh where uh we will tell the story of um moving from a creative, from a dreamer to push the boundaries in technology. Um, and again, about collaborations, I really like to encourage Romanian startups. And 
started to work a bit with a company called Teleport from Cluj. They're a startup that <clears throat> maybe you saw this uh, viral video where you can draw on a whiteboard and it generates code and so on. And we were thinking, what if we push this up a notch? So by designing the screens in the car and combine it with VR, you're able to drive the next display concept in five minutes. So from whiteboard to the car directly. And again, speaking of efficiency, that just makes it crazy. Yeah, it's like in the Iron Man movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And speaking about movies, uh, I was starstruck this week. Uh, I had a call with Alex McDowell. He's the guy who made Minority Report, Fight Club, Black Mirror, wow. um, Man of Steel, you know, a lot of movies. So he's a creative director. and. If you think about Minority Report, that's the first time you saw self-driving cars, AR, uh, you know, the classic scene with Tom Cruise where he works with um, a virtual assistant and a computer. And they started without a script with Steven Spielberg and they had to build a world and their technique is called um, future world building. They start with a question like, how does Tom Cruise get to work in the morning? So they invent self-driving cars. Then, how does he? How does the self-driving cars work? So they invent a traffic system, rules, uh, policies, governments. So then they build a whole world around around a specific scene, and uh, this is kind of how it starts. Like storytelling and VR, it's like you know it works so well. So you can tell. Uh, moving from linear stories as we have in books or movies to interactive, where you choose your destiny, right? And for us, yeah. this platform or way of communicating to people, but also to the CEO or investors, like giving him the VR headset and say, well, this is how 2040 looks like if we produce more diesel cars, or it can be a Black Mirror episode, right? <laughs> this is what happens if we don't take this privacy policy correctly, right? But this green, beautiful world can happen if we all start collaborating and identify these things. So again, the power of storytelling, it's, it's impressive. Like now in my team, instead of hiring lots of researchers and developers, I hired storytellers and musicians and uh, people work, uh, working with philosophy or theology, people that know how to put things in context. Interesting. Taking complex thinking and making it into digestible pieces so the other teams can start working with it. Uh, and I encourage all of you to stay ahead of, of the curve, like build your future and be a trendsetter. Um, thank you. Well, thank you, thank you very much for uh, for a presentation. A lot, a lot of new stuff. Uh, I I loved it. Um, I was looking. Um, yeah, we have some questions, but uh, before jumping to the questions, uh, we were supposed to have a break, oh, yeah, but we didn't Sorry. because uh, <laughs> the presentation was uh, so captivating. So. Uh, I think <laughs> it's better this way. Uh, Sorry, let's, let's have uh, the break right now and then jump to the Q&A. It's okay with you, Timmy? Great. Okay, so my colleagues uh, will share in a minute on the screen uh, the questions. Uh, all of you who are watching us live, please go to oralatechhub.ro slash live. And uh, you'll see the questions popping up. So we have the first question. Um, do you have a creative job? Let's see how many creative people are watching us live uh, right now. Okay. Uh, we are able to see the results in real time. We have uh, people that are voting. Okay. Take your time. It's an easy question. Do you have a creative job? Yes or no? Okay, most of the people said yes. Okay, we have nine people. Let's 
see if we can have 10. Yeah, we just passed 10. Okay. I see that people still vote. Uh, so, um, while people are, are, are still voting, uh, Timmy, what? Well, of course, <laughs> you're an innovation leader at Volvo Cars. Um, your job uh, requires a lot of creativity, creativity but uh, how do you see? Do you need more creativity or do you need more critical uh, assessment and, uh, you know, this, this type th that you define as gravity? Mm. Yeah, I think I think it needs to be a good balance, as I said, and I, and I do think everyone has a creative job. It's a matter of how you approach it and uh, if if you own it in your hand, right? And um, I mean, problem solving in itself requires creativity, right? Mathematics right. require creativity, um, but at the end of the day. Um, I think when we look at innovation, we have a framework and we think in horizons or quadrants, right? So we have the knowns knowns, which for us is building cars. That that we know, that's what we do, that's what keeps our gets our cash flow and so on. Then you have known unknowns, like uh, same trajectory but new business opportunities like yeah. car sharing or you know leasing or it can be other services right then, uh, it unknowns new business like what if we do houses yeah. instead or like we work with uh, more on a societal uh, society level and i think that's how we work through abstraction layers like if we move from the car to the society and then to planetary scale. How do we act in each of these phases? And we have people in the group that are really good in working with the car itself, solving problems around the car. They are more the doers, that's where gravity hits all the time. Then yeah. you have the people that worry about policy making, collaborations with the government, different partners, uh, you know, different questions that affect society and humankind and then people that think on planetary scale where like okay how do we transpose our values like being human-centric care about safety sustainability from making the car to safety in society to safety in the planet which would be translated to sustainability and those requires people that push boundaries, people that are comfortable with the dragons, with the unknown, with, you know, yeah. they're the dragon tamers, I call them. They, they go and ride the dragons and they are comfortable <laughs> with, uh, you know, the future. They, they're comfortable to, to break rules and so on. But not yeah. everyone is and not everyone should. I wouldn't put 80% of my team to do that, right? Because then right. we end as the classic innovation tier, which, which is a circus, which nothing ends up as a product or <laughs> to the market. And innovation, yeah. part of it is how do you get from the Miro boards to the market, to the customer? How do you create value? Of course, yeah. Uh, so I think it needs to be a balance there. So between... you need a balance, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so we have uh, 18 people voted, and 56% uh, said yes. They see themselves as having a creative job. Okay, let's see the next uh, the next question. How do you see VR AR in the next four years? Okay, so um, let's see. Okay. Um, yeah, like every technology, as you said, and uh, you showed that uh, mm -hmm. AR um, is not a new concept. It goes back to the 60s. That's a, a long way back, <laughs> 80 years or not, 60 years. Uh, but 
a lot of people, when they see new technology, they say, well, this is a fad, it's just a toy for rich people. But we had a few of those cycles with this AR technology and it's going to be the, the next four years are cent uh, cert certainly very, very interesting. Um, so most of, of, the, of the people that are watching us live, uh, they think and they see VR, AR uh, as being a ne the next mobile computing platform, having uh, widespread, uh, being widespread. Okay. What, what do you think, Timmy, on this subject? Yeah, I mean, as I presented a few concepts, like imagining future of workspace uh, and not only that, but the way you work out. And and we see that it, it, it's happening more and more. Maybe people don't perceive it as AR, but TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram, they are AR machines. And we saw mm. a product that's been launched in solely in AR like uh, a month ago we collaborated with Balenciaga like the fashion company and they launched their uh, new collection only in a game 3D yes, in VR and we launched with them three car concepts uh, with Polestar where uh, in that future world again the storytelling power being able to put instead of having a classic uh, uh, fashion show where just models walk around here you have a storytelling where you have characters and context. The environment kind of puts the clothing piece in in, uh, in evidence. But it's also, um, I think, the sustainability factor that we won't buy as many clothes. But you could, uh, if we if you wear glasses, you can change skins like you do in the games. So you can have different <laughs> patterns and colors, right? So that so you don't need to buy more right, clothes. Right. So it, it 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 has different areas or like entertainment, the way we consume movies and yeah. games. Like uh, instead of having a linear story, you interact and make your own story with it. So I think it will yeah. catch up a lot. It's interesting and scary in the same. <laughs> yes. In the same time, it's very hard, I think, for most people to see their life different i mean see their life in a virtual dimension mm. but it seems like we're getting there so let's move to the next question 50 percent said that they think uh, this technology would be widespread in the next four years the next question is when do you think self-driving driving cars will come to romania yeah this is very specific uh, okay, I answered. Yeah, that's funny. Can das bura porco? Well, um, with all these technology advancements, we can't be sure that pigs won't fly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true story. <laughs> Um, Somebody's going to do it <laughs> just for the fun of it. <laughs> Somebody's I mean, going to do it. Self-driving cars are not new as a concept either. I mean, uh, there were electric cars 80 years ago. There were right. self-driving cars. And I, as I said, the analogy with, uh, uh, with the horse. horse and so on, right? So yeah. it, it's nothing new there. But if you look at how we work here, we have a partnership with Uber where we gave them 30,000 self-driving cars. So in the wow. US, we, we uh, use them quite a lot. And by self-driving cars, I mean level four. Uh, that it means that it doesn't need human supervision. Um, what happens with uh, Tesla or some of the Volvos or BMW, Audi, it's like level two going towards level three which means that you are behind the steering wheel and when uh, the lines are not clear it's kind yeah. of like autopilot where yeah. it can keep you between the lanes it knows that you have a car in front of you and it stops yeah. um, but there is a heavy transition to level four and the main problem is not technology the sensors are there we have enough data there is ai 
it's more of a user experience problem. You see like people okay. falling asleep or trusting the car too much. So you need to know what the car is doing and the car needs to know what you're up to and that you know that you know that what car <laughs> the car is doing. Okay. So and on top of that you have policies the right. government traffic rules europe is a hard space europe is like you know every country we have eu but still every country have their own traffic rules right. um in us to it's same with the states it, it, it takes seven years to propose and adopt a rule when it comes to traffic and safety policies wow. uh, and that that's a problem because you have governors that are like for four years even presidents they're pushing they're helping the technology to move forward their mm -hmm. mandate expires then you have another person and you need to start it from zero right okay. so it's like really slow so there'll be it's a need to to have a new new mindset and if you look at the car itself uh the roads we have the reason why the roads are so wide and why the cars are as they are is because of two horses two horse asses next to each other since the roman empire there's no metric system or convention or any design reason behind it it's just because of that because wow. we had 2000 year legacy of carrying you know the the road design system since that time Okay. And there are initiatives, like there is an initiative in Saudi Arabia, they're building their own country, Neom, where they start from scratch. They are like, what if we do it from zero, where, you know, there's no regulation, we don't know how the cars look like, but we reinvent the city. So they made this uh, 170 kilo um, It's a line, right? So it's only one road or for trains and so on. And they are rethinking how the roads and the cars look like. We had a similar project with Disney. Uh, why Disney is because they're experts in building worlds and theme parks. If you go to Disney World, they know how to bring 10,000 people in. You wear your bracelet, everything yeah. is in line. You think that you're free, that you can spend as much time you want with Mickey Mouse taking pictures. But by 6 o'clock you're leaving the park even if you want it or you don't want it and it that's yeah. how it's programmed so we're trying to look at efficiency and how, how to rethink the cars and transportation okay uh, so most of the people that responded to to your question uh, don't think that self-driving cars will be a reality in our lifetime uh, yeah. to quote you they think it's it's gonna be a reality when when the pigs yeah. will fly. Yeah. Well, yeah. Timmy, I think you can do it in uh, <laughs> in virtual reality, probably in a commercial mm. <laughs> or something like that. And uh, when you announce uh, level four uh, autonomy cars, put some flying pigs in that commercial. We will. We will. <laughs> Okay, uh, so let's let's go back to to Q and A. Uh, we have a few a few a few questions. Okay, um, let's. Um, we have well the order changed a little bit. Uh, you talked about a lawsuit with uh, Facebook, I guess. Um, Yes, <laughs> ah, I mean, uh, it was like, news. Uh, November um, 2019. Okay. There's still some documentation to be done, but everything is in order. Nice. So yeah. David versus Goliath part two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you won. Congrats. Thank you. That's a big achievement. OK, so it can be done. Um, then um, somebody asked, uh, you said, based on a, a 2019 report, that uh, the increasing uh, request for AIVR um, engineers is because of COVID. I think there's been an... Okay, so somebody asked, asked um, COVID hit in 2020. Is the report you've shown also valid for 2020? 
I, yeah, as I said, the, the values increased even more because people see the need of having more immerse remote from like a uh, remote work possibility where as i said designers that really need to be with a product they need different ways to experiment that so and also uh, entertainment for that purposes so because people are sitting at home more and more they need new ways to you know for entertainment yeah. so that's why and and also there are new tools as i said like Facebook, Amazon, uh, Apple, Google, they're all working on AR glasses yeah. and there is a huge demand. I mean, they are hiring like two, three hundred developers themselves. So, yeah. Yeah. So uh, just to be clear, those numbers were growth rates, not actual numbers. So the yeah. growth yeah. rate is bigger for uh, AR, VR engineering jobs than all yeah. the other yeah. exactly. uh, fields yeah. combined. Yeah. It's not nominal, it's growth no. rate. Okay, um, Theophil asks, uh, it is, uh, is it possible for scenarios like uh, the ones in the Black Mirror to become a reality? How can we prevent such scenarios? Uh, yeah, as I said, working with the creative director that made it, uh, one reason they made Black Mirror is to make people aware, like if, if you saw Black Mirror, their scenarios are not 2050 sci-fi scenarios. It's like the reality as we know it, but a bit off. And that thing is um, the reason why I work at Volvo as well. And because I work with technology, I'm pushing the boundaries till a point where I get scared and then take a step back and understand in order for us as a species not to developing rules and laws and so on and there are more and more forums and communities where people express their ideas you probably saw what happened with gamestop and the reddit community i mean communities are super powerful right they can it, they yeah. break the rules they, influence they can the they can fight point. governments they, so i think in order to not get into a black mirror episode is to to protect the human values and the ethics um like technology ethics like what happens if we develop AI so fast we should start thinking about rules and uh, frameworks for that uh, before it's too late right, so right. that's a way to do it I think okay so it takes people like you that are willing to put in the work and uh, design the technology in a way that is human centric and uh, has the common good in mind, right? Mm. I hope so. More and more people will will join this fight in a way, or like uh, being uh, having courage to push themselves and push the boundaries. Um, as I said, you you need to to be a bit forward to understand what the uncertain times that we are heading to. Uh, so. We have, I think, all the creative tools and development tools and books and so on to actually use those as a lens to look uh, and understand what actions we need to take not to get there. Right, right. Uh, okay, so Colleen uh, asks, uh, he asked, uh, how long do you think it will take to have the whole wor uh, real world mapped uh, in a virtual world? Um, I think that's my cousin, actually. Hey. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I think I saw some reports around it. it as like a, a report came out from Harvard Business School. I think you can search it about uh, the vir virtual twin. Uh, I, I mean, it will take a while, but we are scanning the world every day with this anyhow. Uh, so I think... Like if you look at the new Apple headphones, they will have LiDAR sensor, meaning if I walk 10 times around my office, I already mapped my office, how it looks, right? So um, it, it will be quite accelerated. You see like putting self-driving cars on the road and uh, Tesla fleets that like, you know, uh, everyone that has a Tesla or uh, 
Volvo or Lexus or so on, and you know these cars have a lot of radar and cameras. Uh, they collect a lot of data and generate the 3D data. Of course, compliant with the data collection uh, uh, and privacy. Yeah, so there are regulations, so you, we can anonymize data. But the map, uh, it's kind of having every car acting as a Google Earth car, right? So and. Also, with the phones now, people can uh, crowdsource through cloud, so they are can you can scan with your phone certain areas and they are uploaded. But there'll be there'll be different worlds, I think. There'll be a Facebook world, there'll be a Google world, there'll be a Apple world. And I don't think privacy exists anymore. It's a matter of who do you trust more, which ecosystem, which is really scary. Yeah, really scary and interesting topic. Uh, I would mm -hmm. like to have a different uh, webinar on this to discuss the more philosophical mm -hmm. questions because, yeah, as you said, they, it can be and it is scary just to think of it. Yeah. Um, Amalia says, a very innovative and inspirational presentation and speech. How much delay you do you believe a motor city like Oradia uh, has after very innovative features products are launched? Uh, mm. uh, I think we have a big potential in Oradia. I think we have a good infrastructure. Uh, I believe more and more investors and talent will be attracted there. Um, and, and, and I do believe that we, like some of these technologies will be adopted more and more. And what I encourage people back to focus a lot in product development, user experience, instead of just uh, outsourcing and freelancing, because that doesn't create a healthy, sustainable ecosystem. It pays the bills now, maybe you have a short win, but as an ecosystem in Oradia, for instance, or Cluj, uh, if the outsourcing jobs are out, if they go to cheaper places like Belarus exactly. or Bulgaria or so on, um, then, as I said, it's not that sustainable. We need our own products and we need the startup ecosystem and we need to, to be trendsetters with these technologies. Just look out there, go to conferences, um, learn. And uh, now, like, there's so much uh, material online where you can learn to use these new immersive technologies. They are more accessible. And just, you know, create trends and see the problems we are facing in Oradia, like uh, infrastructure or architecture or the tech development or the industries around it, where they might need help to become more efficient or, you know, so. I think there is plenty of opportunity in, in an under um, uh, underrated place like Oradea in that sense. Okay, okay. But uh, let's say if you launch a f an autonomous uh, vehicle, level four vehicle in uh, Sweden, how long it will take to reach Romania, the streets of Romania? Like first question is like what streets? <laughs> don't we still don't have uh, highways and stuff? Well, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> flying cars probably faster than self-driving cars. <laughs> um, no, I do think we mm, there is a higher chance. I think uh, the Western world, like that, ha that's more like you know developed and rich, where we have like strong infrastructure. People don't want to, yeah, people don't want to own a car here anymore. People don't want a car here anymore. And, yeah. and it's a bit of a paradox. Like in really developed countries, the car is not a necessity anymore. You have like good pub, uh, public transportation, micro mobility, scooter services, and they're enforcing uh, sustainability laws like more, uh, yeah, uh, they take that. Uh, um as a priority as opposed to countries like romania russia where we don't have a healthy or good infrastructure 
that's where people buy premium cars. We can't sell expensive Volvos here. People buy expensive Volvos in Romania or China or Russia. Yeah, a lot of people. And that's a bit of a paradox. Say, well, a lot of people have very, very expensive cars here. Yes. What's going on? They don't. They don't um, understand the phenomenon, and uh, I think you pointed out uh, very clearly why. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we have uh, a very rated question: Is Black Mirror a documentary? Uh, that's an interesting one. Uh, I saw <laughs> this summer the most innovative ad, and it was a Black Mirror ad. I think it was like when the lockdown started, so I was in a bus stop, and there was actually a mirror, and there was the ad, and you looked in the mirror, and it says Black Mirror Season 6, you're living it now, right? And that was a really powerful, powerful message. So yeah. <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> yeah. uh, I guess it is a documentary and not a movie, if that's the question. Yes. And yes, interesting. So this virtual reality comes closer to, <laughs> to our reality. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we have two questions, two more questions. One is related to the subject, one is not related to, su to the subject. Uh, let's go to the one related to what we talked today. Um, what are your prediction on future of the unity with DOTS and AR? What expectations do you have based on AR in the future? Uh, yes, I do think so, and I think the combination of the DOTS framework where it's really focused on performance and efficiency and uh, to the point that I was with capturing a virtual world where for instance based on blockchain and like 5G and so on now I'm throwing all the buzzwords in one sentence but like AR combined with those technologies will, will um, really push AR uh, forward as in having uh, virtual objects anchored precisely in the real world and they will stay there, right? So I can have a virtual cup of coffee in Starbucks in Lotus and if I go there in two weeks, it's still the same without a drift. And I think with DOTS framework, we can have thousands of such of virtual objects in the same scene in a really, really efficient way. Timmy, it, it's been a a great time, a lot of new stuff, a lot of interaction. We had a lot of questions from the public. I think uh, this asks for another round, probably in the future. Hopefully you will say yes and you, you can make room in your busy schedule. Thank you very much for your time again. And uh, to everyone, everyone who is watching, uh, we will meet again uh, next week. You'll see the announcement uh, here and also on our Facebook page. We'll have uh, an interesting topic. Uh, we have somebody that works at AMD. Uh, we'll talk about graphics processing units, a lot of geeky stuff. So stay tuned. Uh, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, on our YouTube channel. Please go and click subscribe. And uh, till next time, see you. Bye-bye. Thank you.